testing. All right, we're going to get going here. Thank you so much for joining us in person or virtually. Uh, my name is Sarah Conway, and I am the head of the ecosystem resilience practice within the disaster risk finance and parametrics team at WTW. Um, we develop novel risk financing instruments, generally parametric insurance solutions, with trusted local partners uh, for at-risk ecosystems around the world, um, as well as um, the solutions for the livelihoods that depend on the same ecosystems and their services. Um, we also develop solutions to de-risk debt instruments, uh, including blue bonds, to help uh, protect them from climate shocks. Um, I have worked in a range of areas uh, in traditional finance, conservation finance, climate finance, including serving as the lead climate finance negotiator for the US delegation to UNFCCC through COP21. Uh, and now I have the honor and, and privilege of getting to work on very innovative uh, insurance solutions with partners, including TNC and Rare, joined uh, with me here, as well as Maria Jose Gonzalez from the MAR Fund. Thank you for joining us virtually, Maria Jose. Um, let me, before we dive into the conversation, I'm just gonna quickly introduce the panelists. Uh, to my left, we have Lisa, oh, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, Schindler-Murray. Um, Lisa is the Director of Natural Cap Climate Solutions and Blue Carbon at RARE, a conservation organization uh, focused on behavior and community-driven solutions. She's based in Berlin, Germany, uh, where she is part of the innovative finance team and leads on building RARE's nature-based financing portfolio. Prior to joining RARE, she worked at TNC, the Nature Conservancy on International Climate Policy, including Red Plus, uh, Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, and Blue Carbon in the UNFCCC and other international fora. Um, Dr. Andrew Dutz, uh, to my farther left, <laughs> is with the Nature Conservancy, where he serves as the Director of Global Policy, Institutions, and Conservation Finance. It's quite the title, quite, quite the portfolio. Um, where he directs, amongst other things, the Conservancy's global policy work spanning the areas of climate change, biodiversity, oceans, and conservation finance, um, as well as oversees the relationships with international organizations, MDBs, and foreign aid agencies. Prior to TNC, he served in several leadership uh, roles with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and has also served as the acting lead forest negotiator for the U.S. State Department um, and as the forest policy advisor to the World Bank. And joining us virtually is Maria Jose, a wildlife biologist. She is the executive director of the MAR Fund, a regional conservation fund whose mission is to drive funding and partnerships for the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of the Mesoamerican reef. Based in Guatemala City, Maria Jose has served in this role since 2005. She also manages somehow to juggle other roles, including serving on the executive committee uh, for the Latin American and Caribbean Network of Environmental Funds, REDLAC, and on the board of the Coral Reef Alliance. Uh, before I open it up to the panelists, I just wanted to quickly introduce a few of the terms uh, that we'll be sort of covering today, just to, to make sure that we're all on the, the same page. So I guess first, indemnity insurance. So indemnity can be defined as a contractual obligation to compensate an individual or a business for a quantified assessed loss or damage. This includes the usual things that most of us are probably familiar with, all too familiar with, home insurance, health insurance, et cetera. Um, second, parametric insurance, which again is sort of where we tend to, to focus on my team at WTW. Um, parametric insurance is a risk financing instrument as well that offers a pre-specified payout based upon a pre-agreed trigger event or events. These triggering events depend on the nature of the policy and, in, and can include environmental triggers such as wind speed or rainfall. Um, the event characteristics are selected such that they serve as an effective proxy for the loss or damage or impact. In other words, the key requirement underpinning a parametric product is that it captures 
financial impacts as a function of an objective and independent hazard parameter or parameters, um, the occurrence of which are reliably and transparently available both in real time and historically. Unlike indemnity insurance, which can sometimes you know, take a, a long time uh, to, to conclude through the loss adjustment process and does require quantified loss to have occurred. Um, parametric insurance, because you have pre-agreed to all of these things, it, it can pay out very quickly. Um, and third, just very briefly, when we think about sort of applying parametric insurance in the context um, of coastal and, and marine ecosystems and, and resilience, we, we generally tend to see sort of two clear sweet spots where at least it makes sense to, to consider it within the context of a broader set of conservation and climate finance solutions. The first is where you have a good payout use case where having money very quickly after a shock event has high value. So um, having money immediately after a hurricane to do uh, immediate reef response. The other is where you can guarantee that important payments will be made after a shock event reduces or eliminates the normal uh, revenue stream that has historically supported those payments. So for example, to ensure that a sovereign government is able to continue to service its semi-annual debt servicing payments following a damaging um, hurricane event. So that um, is a lot, and I'm gonna stop talking now, um, but just wanted to at least kind of give everybody an, an introduction to the, to the basics uh, and the, the, some of the terms that you, that you might hear and maybe are less familiar with. So now to the fun part, we're gonna talk about some concrete examples of how these tools are being applied in the real world. Not things that could happen, but things that are happening. Um, so Lisa, we're gonna start with you first. Um, and in this case, we're gonna look at the application of insurance to help protect livelihoods, and more specifically, uh, the livelihoods of small-scale fishers, a significant sector of the blue economy with around 50 million worldwide. Most of these fishers lack access to basic insurance products, uh, let alone insurance to protect against the impacts that they're beginning to feel um, due to changing weather conditions that are inhibiting or changing their ability to safely go out and, and fish. Um, could you sort of share a bit more on how Rare is working very well and, and very diligently to ensure that this protection gap is being closed? Thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks for, for having me here. Um, so Rare is, is currently working to develop resiliency in our coastal communities by, by bringing insurance to the small scale fishers um, through two separate insurance programs. Um, the first is an indemnity program. Um, so remembering what, what our first uh, terminology update here, we, we now know what, what an indemnity program is. And that helps our fishers and their families access basic livelihoods coverage, such as life insurance, health insurance, property insurance, um, all through microinsurance. Um, and the planning for this uh, microinsurance program, it began in 2019. Uh, and that was as part of a landscape analysis where we surveyed fishers and our savings club members uh, to well, in the savings club members that were in the Philippines. Um, and through that, and through that uh, survey, we learned that while less than 20% of them had insurance, there was a demand and a willingness to pay for it. Um, so we started to plan for a pilot project knowing, uh, knowing this information. And that was aimed to launch in, in March of 2020. So I don't need to tell all of you that our plans changed a little bit. And we had to um, consult with our partners and, and other insurers. And so through that consultation, we agreed that, um, that instead of the typically higher number of fishers for um, the mark of success, it would be just 500. Um, and, and that would be the marker to, to measure uh, the necessary um, threshold for a proof of concept. Uh, and despite this, 4,000 people registered in just eight weeks. And so the demand there is, is real. Um, and so what makes the indemnity microinsurance program really unique is that RARE is leveraging our savings club work and is providing insurance literacy training prior to, pro to providing the product offerings. And we have actually seen that for every one person trained, 
uh, two people will register for insurance. And so this program has since expanded throughout the Philippines and, and into Indonesia, Mozambique, and Honduras. Um, and the other program that I'll mention that we're working to launch um, is the parametric insurance program that provides the loss of income protection to our fishers to help protect their income from the increase in bad weather, um, bad weather days that we're seeing due to climate change. And this concept for this product was designed in collaboration with you at WTW um, and was built around the rec uh, 2014 research paper that had demonstrated that over the course of a fisher, fisher, um, fisher's life that they'll lose more money from bad weather days than from one catastrophic event, like a, a typhoon or a hurricane. And so <clears throat> this is... Um, this is partly because with small-scale fisheries, you're using smaller boats. And so with smaller boats, you're unable to access the seas if the weather is bad, if it's raining or if the winds are too high. Um, and so in these circumstances, they're, they're not able to go fishing for, um, for their livelihoods, partly because of visual cues or because it's not safe. Um, and so to start addressing this program or problem, we are trying to design a program um, where we worked with, with WTW to design a coverage that's trigger, that is triggered by those weather conditions. Um, so instead, it would be more of an ag aggregate number of days um, of lost fishing days uh, in a set period of time rather than, um, rather than an aggregate or a, um, not a consecutive number. Um, and so that means that if the rain or the wave height or the winds um, are over a certain threshold for any three consecutive days in a five-day period, that coverage will then be triggered at that point rather than that, that consecutive amount. <clears throat> and so to determine if, we, if this product would be even technically feasible, um, WTW uh, analyzed uh, 41 years of data and completed a feasibility analysis uh, in, I guess, in 2022 um, to start establishing that technical feasibility. Um, so we're working to now pilot this project uh, in the Philippines with, uh, with about 50,000 fishers. And in this pilot, we are working with the, um, the Philippines government, uh, BFAR, as a policyholder, and then the registered fishers as the beneficiaries. So meaning that the fishers will receive that direct payment um, if that policy is triggered, so if the bad weather is preventing them from, from going out fishing. Um, and so we're anticipating that this product will, will drive both fisher registration, resulting in reduced overfishing, um, uh, because the loss, um, or without the loss of, of income protection, the fishers then resort to, um, to overfishing on the good weather days. And so we're trying to um, address all of these, these issues through this in insurance um, scheme. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, it's been a real pleasure working with you and your team at Rare on that one in particular. I mean, just super exciting, first of its kind stuff. So thank you for all of your hard work on that one in particular. So you've really yeah, highlighted some awesome you know, solutions for, for small scale fishers that help to protect them against both, you know, the increasingly frequent storms and the bad weather um, that, that they might be experiencing and, and other forms of unexpected events and sort of the dual purpose of the indemnity and the parametric. It's, uh, I, I think it's really exciting and hopefully these can be scaled and replicated not only within the Philippines, but you know, in, in other economies as well. Um, okay, but so that's the livelihoods, but what about the ecosystems them, themselves, how, um, you know, that the fishers de depend upon? So I'm gonna turn to Maria Jose next. Um, let's talk about the ecosystems for, for a second, and, and more specifically the coral reef ecosystems of the Mesoamerican reef known as the, the Mar, which is about a thousand kilometers of reef that stretches from Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, the MAR insurance program, now in its third renewal year, so, you know, tried and, and tested, um, is using a parametric insurance solution to ensure <laughs> that funds are rapidly available for immediate reef response following hurricane events. Um, of course, you know, deploying these payouts should a triggering event occurs, and it's always a bit tricky with insurance because you don't really want to have to, you know, you don't want that triggering event, but if it happens, then you're, you're happy you've had that insurance. Um, 
but should a triggering event occur in, in this particular case, the only way that the payout would be deployed is, of course, if you have done sufficient planning, right, that you have, that you have planned um, and developed your, your response um, capacities prior, prior to a potential triggering event. So just curious, Maria Jose, if you can share with the audience, based on your experience and, and role as the policyholder of the MAR insurance program, and your relationship with the local partners on the ground at the 11 covered sites, just sort of a little bit more on how the MAR insurance program fits within the broader Reef Rescue Initiative. And again, this connection between the, the, the planning and preparatory phase coupled with having the insurance policy in place for if and when a triggering event occurs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to be on this panel. I only regret I cannot be there in person. Um, first of all, I would like to mention that we have designed the Mar Insurance Program in collaboration with you, with, with this Towers Watson. We have raised the funds together in support of premium financing and for the implementation of the entire program. And it has been wonderful to work together. I will begin with your last question first. Um, the Reef Rescue Initiative's goal is to strengthen the recovery and resilience of the Mesoamerican Reef through different components that include long-term funding mechanisms, collaboration with and support to governments at different levels, local, national, and regional, the use of risk management instruments, and building capacities for the emergency response and continued restoration of coral reefs. And all the elements of the MAR Insurance Program fit into the initiative's goal and align with the components I just listed. If they still target strengthening the resilience of the Mesoamerican Reef. As the policyholder, Marcant has purchased the aggregated premium for all the sites and across the four countries directly. And in the current uh, policy, as you mentioned, there are 11 sites that are covered. We have been able to do this thanks to the generous support from, from key donors, such as the Insu Resilience Solutions Fund and the Adaptation Fund Climate Innovation Accelerator of UNDP. Marfund administers the funds from the payout, and we are able to deliver the payout to the covered sites. So we have installed procedures uh, to ensure that the impacted sites can receive the payouts in a timely manner, which is part of that planning that you mentioned. For example, when Hurricane Lisa impacted Terneth Atoll in Belize in November of 2022 and triggered a payout, the insurance carriers deposited the payout in the emergency fund that Marfund has that was previously established. And they did this in under 14 days. We were able to transfer the funds to the organization that co-manages the Terneth Marine Reserve within two days of them being deposited into the emergency fund so that they could begin to conduct that response in the water. And for this, we had agreed previously that uh, in this in every country, that any payouts will go to a pre-selected NGO that can very quickly uh, receive the funds and be able to take action and make payments, right, to purchase the, the services and, and, and make the contracts that are required for the emergency response. So this includes uh, purchasing food and materials that you need to go underwater, uh, diving tanks, uh, boat captains, hiring the boat captains and the boats, fuel, paying for the per diem for the, for the uh, brigades that go into the water to do that emergency action. Also, by working closely with the environmental authorities in, in, in the measurement with the protected area managers and in collaboration with other partners, such as the Nature Conservancy, we have worked to establish a response governance and the emergency response capacities in the four countries to enable them to attend the sites that are covered by the insurance. To date, there are 100. 41 first responders that have been trained and certified for the Mesoamerican Reef, and they integrate 14 brigades. Uh, they, are, they now call themselves Reef Guardians. About three weeks ago, we had a regional workshop for the exchange of experiences in this post-storm response capacity between the four countries, and it was great to learn that the Reef Guardians are very proud of their knowledge and capacity to respond in an emergency. And we learned that it goes beyond hurricanes. They recently collaborated in Mexico in a relocation of stony corals that were at risk due to stony coral tissue loss disease. They, they took them from one site to an area that was less um, uh, exposed to the disease. And, and this was done because they had the capacities from learning about the hurricane response. We also learned, on the other hand, that there is high rotation in the brigades. 
and that we guardians will require refresher courses. So we are, you know, we're beginning to plan for these aspects moving forward. Now, the basis of the work that has been carried out has been communication and joint work with governments of the four countries. From the beginning of the program, we formalized collaboration with, uh, with the authorities of the four countries, and they have been involved from the get-go uh, since the selection of the coral sites that were to be covered by the insurance. So in summary, the program includes several elements, the purchase of the premium, of course, but also the capacity to provide prompt and effective payouts to impacted sites, and the construction of the required governance and capacity building to actually do the response under the water after a hurricane. And all of this has been done in close collaboration with the governments of the four countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Jose. And, and yeah, I mean, you've really highlighted the role that parametric insurance can play within the context of a broader conservation and if it initiative. And, and also, you know, the need for preparedness to ensure that the payouts can be deployed quickly for their intended purposes. So thank you so much for sharing those great lessons and experiences. I think, you know, in, in this case, parametric insurance is probably the only financial instrument that, that could have been able to, you know, in the case of the, the Hurricane Lisa payout, you know, to give you the resources that, that you required at scale um, to engage in those actions, right? Otherwise, it, it probably wouldn't have been, been made possible. So pretty, pretty exciting that that liquidity could have been injected and that you were able to, to use it for its purposes. Um, there's obviously a lot of other examples, so I'm going to turn next to Andrew. Um, you know, TNC has, has really been at the forefront of the deployment of, in particular, parametric insurance in a range of, of different ways. Um, you were involved in conceiving of and, and helping to launch the coral reef and beach insurance program for the state of Quintana Roo in Mexico. Um, you also are the policyholder for the only parametric coral reef policy for the U.S., for the state of Hawaii. Um, and, and of course, uh, you included a catastrophe or resilience wrapper, as we now like to call it, um, around the blue bond issuance on the back end of the Belize debt conversion back in, in 2021. So really you know, great to see all of the great leadership that the TNC has played in, in progressing these ideas. Um, since we've covered livelihoods, ecosystems, I would love to ask you a bit more about the resilience wrapper piece. Um, you know, there's been a lot of attention at COP28 and of course more broadly on, on sort of the correlation between fiscal risk and climate risk, um, on sustainable debt levels. TNC's Nature Bonds program, I believe it's now called, is at the forefront, of course, of leveraging debt refinancing for action on conservation and climate practices and priorities. Um, curious if you could just you know, share with the audience a little bit more about the Belize transaction, sort of the first of its, its kind with the wrapper, um, sort of why you, you know, sort of decided to include, or why Belize decided to include the resilience wrapper in that case, and you know, whether you think um, this is a scalable solution in other contexts as, as you look ahead for future transactions. Thanks. Sure, thanks. And, and as the third partner on the stage with WTW, let me just first things like, thank you for being a partner in all of these innovations. We super appreciate that. Um, the expertise and the balance sheet that you bring has been super helpful. And the partners behind you, or the guess clients, but we look at them as partners. But, you know, the ecosystem that you bring to the, the financial ecosystem that you bring and the spirit of innovation has been fantastic to partner with, so thank you. So let me first start with explaining the debt swap that we did with Belize and then the places where insurance comes into the play and then how we think it can actually be scaled even further. So <clears throat> Belize, like a lot of developing countries, has a fairly large debt portfolio. Um, it was on the verge of default in 2021. So we did a debt conversion with them, which is basically kind of like refinancing your mortgage with a lower interest rate. It makes sense because it saves you money. And the way this transaction worked is we worked with the government of Belize to purchase their entire euro bonds portfolio. So it was their private sector held debt as opposed to their government, you know, their debt from the World Bank or the debt from the U.S. government. So it was their, all of their commercial debt that was out in the, in the private marketplace. It was about $550 million face value. Because they were close to default, and their economy wasn't doing great, it was trading at a discount. So we were able to purchase that for about $350 million. And then they had to issue new bonds at a face value of $350 million to service the debt payback. Right? And that's sort of the, the swap part, the old debt that was trading at a, due, at a discount for the new debt trades at, at face value. 
But the secret that makes that happen is credit enhancement. Somebody, in this case the U.S. government, has to step up and say, we will guarantee Belize's continued payments. Because they were at, they said, close to default. So the credit rating agencies are like, this is not a, a good bet. And they had a double C credit rating, which is not investment grade, meaning a typical Wall Street investor is not going to invest in that. With the help of some from their friends, in this case, the US government's Overseas Development Finance Corporation, or it was OPIC at the time, now DFC, Development Finance Corporation, they got the credit rating up to AA minus, which is investment grade, meaning institutional investors will buy that because it fits their emerging market portfolio or it fits their ESG portfolio. And they got a much lower interest rate than they would have gotten trying to go out to the market on their own. That creates a savings, and then that savings goes into paying for conservation of the Mesoamerican reef. It's a critical economic asset for Belize. About 40% of their GDP depends on the tourism industry, and about one in 10 jobs is in the fisheries sector. And both tourism and fisheries are highly dependent on the health of the reef. Right? So it's great for a more conservation perspective, but it's essential as an economic asset. Now, DFC offers political risk insurance. What, what their actual product is doing is saying, if Belize doesn't pay what they owe their creditors, and you go and sue them, and they don't abide by the arbitral award, then the US government will step in and pay the money. So it's technically a political risk insurance. Now, here's the, the first place where insurance comes into place is, is that's the form of the credit enhancement that gets Belize from paying 14% interest to paying 6% interest. But secondly, DFC does these deals all the time. They actually then turn to the, the reinsurance industry and reinsure out about 50% of their exposure in these kinds of deals. So that's one place. Now, that's not particularly innovative. D, that's DFC's standard business model that allows them to stretch their balance sheet twice as far. The innovation comes on the sort of the back end of the transaction. Belize, like any other you know, Caribbean country, faces high hurricane risk. And so the risk is if they get struck by a hurricane, they run out of cash or they need to spend money on restoration, they don't have money to pay back the bondholders. So the innovation here was the, we're now calling it the resilience wrapper, which is that Belize purchased an insurance, it was brokered by WDW, um, I think it was with Munich Re, as the actual risk transfer partner, where if there is a hurricane or certain parametric threshold is triggered, there's a payout to Belize that will cover their next debt repayment, right? So they have to, re they have to pay a coupon payment to the bondholders every six months. So if there's a hurricane, their next, month, their next six monthly payment is covered so they can spend the their regular cash flow instead dealing with the results or the, the impacts of the hurricane. That also had the impact of improving the credit worthiness of that debt issuance, right? Because it means every investor in Belize knows there's a risk of a hurricane, but oh, I'm going to get my money even if there's a hurricane and Belize has to worry about restoring coastal ecosystems and helping out the fishers and, and rebuilding coastal infrastructure. So again, that contributed to the credit worthiness of Belize and lowered their interest rate. Last point is, so how do we scale that? You might be familiar with something called the pause clause, which is the, one of the newest things in sovereign debt issuance. Um, thanks to Mia Motley in Barbados, um, this has been getting a lot of attention. And the idea, and sort of started with, there have been hurricane clauses in the past and a few other debt issuances. During the pandemic, the World Bank and the IMF adopted this idea of what's called the Debt Sustainability Suspension Initiative, that because of the economic needs of countries during the pandemic, the World Bank told the least developed countries, you don't need to pay us, pay back your debt for a year. We'll just tack on that payment to the end, extended at the end of the year. But for the next year, spend your money dealing with the health crisis in your country. As part of the Bridgetown Initiative, which is Mia Motley's idea of how to reform the global debt architecture, she's been calling for the standardization of these so-called pause clauses, meaning if there's a hurricane or some other disaster, the developing country that's affected would not have to repay external creditors so that they could use the money instead to deal with the immediate disaster relief. Makes eminent sense. A number of governments, so the World Bank is trying to figure out how to institutionalize this on a regular basis. The UK government has said that they will do this. So it works pretty well for public 
debt, right? If you're Belize and you're or Barbados and you're borrowing from the UK government or the US government or the World Bank, you get hit by a disaster and you pause your pay payments, that's in effect a foreign aid subsidy now from one of those institutions or governments to your government at a time of a national economic crisis or humanitarian crisis. So that, that makes sense. It's kind of a, a different form of foreign aid. The innovation opportunity here for scale comes for the private debt markets, right? So if you're a private investor in Belize, you're not in the business of providing humanitarian assistance when there is a hurricane. You still want your debt payment. So the idea is that you could actually scale up the model, the innovation that WTW came up with, with Belize of this catastrophe or resilience wrapper on a sovereign debt issuance to the private commercial markets and use that as a model for future sovereign debt issuances as a way to both lower the credit rating, or sorry, lower the interest rate, raise the credit rating, lower the interest rate at the time of issuance, and ensure that there's an additional cash flow there that's needed if there is a disaster. And the private bondholders are still getting their payment, but the country has the money it needs to deal with the disaster. So we see a big upside. We've done some back in the envelope math in a, in a world of sovereign debt markets of about $2.2 .2 trillion, we think there's somewhere between $650 and $800 billion worth of outstanding emerging market debt that is amenable to this kind of transaction structure, which is a huge potential market where you could add on, on the backside, this kind of catastrophe wrapper or resilience wrapper to help solve both the climate finance challenge and lowering the cost and therefore helping solve a little bit the debt per challenge that these countries are facing. So insurance has a big role to play, both on the how to provide the credit enhancement, helping DFC and others provide the credit enhancement, and then on the back end in terms of making sure countries have the cash flow they need to pay their creditors and deal with humanitarian or economic crises in the form of hurricanes or other emergencies. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. And yeah, really exciting stuff. And it's, it's worth throwing another sort of application of the resilience wrapper into the into the mix. It was just announced uh, last week that WTW is going to be a recipient of USAID EDGE funding um, to actually work closely with, with DFC to think about how they could apply resilience wrappers around their private lending to adaptation investments in climate vulnerable countries. So a lot of, yeah, really interesting applications, both in the sovereign debt space as well as in the, the private or corporate debt space as well. So. Looking forward to working together and getting the 650 to 800 billion. I mean, that's that's going to keep us busy for a while, I suspect. But always, a, always a pleasure to collaborate. So let's let's do it. Um, so you've each highlighted some just awesome examples and applications of how the insurance sector is helping to protect livelihoods, ecosystems, natural capital, and and also to to help enhance debt sustainability. Um, you know, that said, of course, you know, we're, we're the first to admit that insurance is, is really just, you know, one instrument in, in a series of, in a portfolio, ideally, of, of many. Um, it's, it's not a silver bullet solution, um, but we also think it has an important role to play and would like to see it increasingly mainstreamed into conversations around climate and, and conservation finance. So, you know, would just like to, to turn to each of you as, you know, as leaders in this space, um, what, do you, what do you think is required to mainstream insurance into climate and, and conservation efforts? What advice do you have for organizations that are beginning to, to think about this and, and beginning to explore the role that insurance might play in, in their own efforts? And maybe I'll go to you first, Lisa. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I think I have uh, three pieces of advice um, for thinking about how we are, are looking at insurance and conservation. Um, the first, um, going back to the small-scale fishery sector, I think that that's a sector that's been really overlooked uh, by insurers, even the micro-insurers. And maybe they haven't been thought of as a viable sector for, for market penetration or growth, um, but whatever the case may be, um, RARE's micro-insurance program has uh, demonstrated that there is both a demand and a willingness to pay for it. Um, but now the problem that we're seeing is access. And so while we're continuing, a number of the communities still lack reliable connectivity. And so one of the, um, so this access issue is one of the issues that still need to be grappled with. And so I think one uh, piece of advice is, is looking at that access, um, the access barrier. 
Um, the second I would say is that um, is that metrics alone, like uh, like registration days, are, are not enough. Uh, if we're if the community doesn't have an agent or a, a clear way to file claims, um, then the program doesn't work. Um, and our work is, is really based on trust. Um, at Rare, we work with communities and build the relationships with, um, with local stakeholders and local governments. And so, um, so trust is an important um, for, for that body of work. And so we can't ask the fishing communities to invest in insurance if it isn't going to um, perform the way that we are describing it. Um, so. Uh, so the, the trust there is, is important in making sure that it's going to um, work in the way that, that we're in, intending. Um, the last piece of advice is that, that insurance literacy training is an absolute must. Uh, fishing communities have not had access to insurance and are often unfamiliar with the insurance products, as you, you mentioned uh, at the beginning. And so really raising that level of awareness and capacity building is, is critical. Thanks. That, that's all super helpful, I think. Yeah, very practical and pragmatic uh, advice. Uh, maybe over to you, Maria Jose, next to, to share a few insights and, and recommendations to those thinking about venturing into the wonderful world of insurance. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think it's important that to, to continue using the insurance, right? To continue applying it, replicating it in other areas, and adapting it accordingly. Uh, by using it and having more and more results, I think it can be mainstreamed. In the Mesoamerican Reef, I think it's important to continue the initiative, to incorporate lessons learned that we have so far, and to adapt and improve. Um, as feasible, ideally, we would like to incorporate other sites uh, into the insurance program to have full coverage of the Mesoamerican Reef. At the moment, with the 11 sites that are covered, most of the reef is under parametric insurance coverage, but I think there are still a couple of areas that we could expand to, maybe in the northern part of the region in Quintana Roo. And to mainstream insurance into climate and conservation efforts, again, it is important to replicate in other geographies that have high hurricane risks for corals. We have been working uh, with other environmental fund colleagues to trial the program in the insular Caribbean with the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund and in the Colombian Caribbean with Fondo Acción. And uh, I think it's important you know, to try them in, in, in different spaces just uh, to, to uh, define what the details are to adapt them to each location. So although the parametric insurance model of concentric circles that was designed by WTW may be applied in other regions with hurricane risk, the other elements of the program also need to be in place, such as an effective mechanism to receive the insurance payouts and then transfer the funds to the affected sites in a timely manner, and the construction of the response governance and capacity so that you can take, undertake that emergency response under the, under the water and begin attending the corals that may have been impacted. Now, these last two may depend on each country or region and the way that different institutions are set up and operate uh, within each context. Uh, for capacity building on the emergency response, the, which are you know, the steps you need to follow after an event in terms of cleaning up the reef and beginning the rehabilitation process, the protocol that was developed by the Nature Conservancy is a wonderful tool, and I think it may be uh, updated this coming year. But the details of the response governance may vary from country to country, right? What, what government stakeholders will be involved, for example? And what civil society partners are you going to work with? Who will integrate the brigades? That may be different. And so it is important to adapt to each situation as long as all the elements are in place for a quick and viable response. I would also recommend that for organizations interested in exploring insurance for coral reefs, it is important to first determine if the coral area is high risk for hurricanes. You know, you would not want to develop a program and purchase insurance if the area is low risk. And, uh, you know, at Marfund, we are more than happy to, to share the details of our program and lessons learned to help others that may be interested begin to think about it and, and install it and replicate. 
Thank you so much, Maria Jose. Yeah, I mean, indeed, you make a lot of really great points about how you know these are very context and location specific considerations that ultimately you know need to be incorporated to ensure that it is a fit for purpose solution. Um, and and really do appreciate Marfun's support in in this area though, and just helping um, as as we continue to to carry this type of solution to other geographies. Uh, Marfun has been a great partner in, in sharing lessons and, and experiences, which, which is truly you know invaluable. There's there's only a handful of these experiences so far. You know, hopefully looking to the future, there will be there will be many more, but um, there there aren't yet that many. So yeah, really appreciate your leadership and, and your willingness to to help uh, inform others that are interested in the space. So yeah, over to you, Andrew, to to share your thoughts. Thanks. So I actually want to step back a minute because I think the biggest contribution from the insurance and reinsurance industry is actually the whole approach and mentality around risk rather than any individual project. And what I mean about it is that the approach of risk assessment, risk sharing, risk transfer. This is COP28. I don't mean to date myself, but I was at COP1. And we complain now about the dominance of the and number of the fossil fuel lobbyists that are here. Believe me, there were a lot of fossil fuel lobbyists at COP1 30 years ago pretty much dominating the discourse. But interest, the insurance industry was there too. Like Swiss Re and Munich Re were coming out with reports on the climate science and what that meant for risk for countries, for industries, and for their businesses. And you know, we're obviously in a much different place than the fossil fuel industry when thinking about risk. Because, um, and just think for a minute what would have happened if policymakers in 1992 had adopted the approach and recommendations of Munich Re and Swiss Re compared to adopting the recommendations of Saudi Arabia. We'd be in a very, very different place today. And I, you know, I come from the United States where we have a national flood insurance program, for example, that does not do risk-based pricing. So in effect, the US government is subsidizing housing and construction in high-risk areas, knowing full well that they're high-risk. A private sector risk mentality would never do that because it just doesn't make sense. So my point is if we can do a better job of sort of mainstreaming the risk assessment tools and the risk transfer, it would shift a lot of the investment in infrastructure, in housing, and other critical assets, um, particularly in coastal areas, riparian areas, but increasingly now in drought-prone areas, in fire-prone areas. I think it, we have a really different way of thinking about human interaction and infrastructure in the landscapes if we were taking a much more rigorous risk assessment approach to what we're doing going forward. Yeah, no, that's an excellent, excellent point, and appreciate you appreciate you making it. Um, look, this has been a super rich conversation so far, and hopefully everyone else here and online have, have enjoyed it. I don't know which, which screen I'm supposed to be looking at, so sorry if I'm sort of scanning uh, the room here. But, um, just want to open it up to those that are, I think, just with us in person. Um, surely you must have some questions for, for the panelists, so please please feel free to jump in. I think we have a microphone that'll come around or not. Great, thank you. If you could just introduce yourself and ask your question, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Miko from Japan. I'm TNFT Task Force alternate member for the MS and the insurance group. <laughs> so it's, but I'm not, not really an ex insurance expert. But, but uh, my question is, well, your, how can I say, over broader overview is, of course, very important because I, I think it's beyond ocean because it's really a you know, whole sector thing. But, but this is ocean pavilion, so I return to ocean type of thing. Because you talk about hurricane, you talk about typhoon because it's Philippines, or probably cyclone. But in thinking of the ocean ecosystem, do you think that the parametric insurance is only applicable to those type of you know, so-called storms? How about other type of destruction? And so if, Probably that is WTW who can, in a sense, invent. So what's your plan for other type of you know, ecosystem damaging factors or destruction of coastal line? 
Yeah, no, that's a that's a great great question. Um, so indeed, there's a lot of different stressors that marine and coastal ecosystems are are facing. I'll just give you a few examples of, of things that we have worked on or are working on. Um, so the first being, we actually partnered with um, some groups in Australia, Queensland, Australia, with uh, resources from um, the. Great Barrier Reef Foundation, and they were interested in trying to reduce or limit the fertilizer runoff that was coming from sugarcane farmers and that was ultimately running off and, and impacting the Great Barrier Reef. And we were able to, to design a, a product for the sugarcane farmers that basically will trigger or pay out if the yields that they achieve via using less fertilizer is actually lower than they otherwise would have achieved with the original fertilizer use. And interestingly, in that particular case, the money that they save from having to buy less fertilizer is actually more than enough to cover for the insurance premium payment, meaning it's sort of like, I don't know, everyone wins, right? They're, they're saving money. The Great Barrier Reef is, is not impacted by as much runoff. Um, and, and so on. So that's just, again, w one example. Uh, and another one that we're increasingly starting to look at in more of the, the sort of slow onset side of things is actually coral bleaching. Um, it, it, it isn't a solution, you know, and, and as with those that are linked to hurricane or cyclone or wind, um, you know, degree heating weeks, sort of the, the trigger that we would utilize in a coral bleaching instance is not going to apply for every coral reef ecosystem that may be impacted by coral bleaching. But we are starting to try to determine and figure out, is there a way to design a parametric insurance solution that would pay out um, either, you know, a dual trigger sort of as it's at four degree heating weeks, in which case you could maybe take some degree of anticipatory action. You could um, compensate fishers to not fish and, and maybe that reduction and additional stressor would help to minimize or mitigate the impact of the bleaching. And there's all kinds of things I keep reading about, uh, you know, probiotics that they're injecting into the water to try to limit bleaching, um, building artificial clouds. So I think there's, a, there's sort of the technical question on the parametric insurance design itself. And then, of course, there's the question of, is there a, a good payout use case that you know, would justify paying the premium associated with having a parametric insurance policy. So really good question. And again, we're, we're trying to, as much as we can and as much as makes sense, um, deploy parametric insurance solutions to, to help other stressors for marine and coastal ecosystems, both, you know, those that are more kind of on the shock event side of things, as well as potentially the, the slow onset. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? There we go. Hi, uh, such a great panel. I learned a lot. Um, I have I've been doing my doctoral field work with small scale fishing communities in India most of this year. So the questions really flow out of that because insurance is a very present conversation in many of those communities. Um, the first, I suppose, is asking all of you with your experience, what is it about insurance in marine and coastal spaces that is distinct from, say, insuring on land or I guess the question I'm asking is about the specificities of designing for these particular places that might present certain unique challenges and what those might be. And uh, the second actually flows out of a comment made on the FEMA flood insurance program. And thinking about um, insurance tends to be rather reactive in some senses, um, though I understand that there's a lot going into how do you prepare for the future as well and you know how do you build resilience into insurance products. But I'm wondering, uh, for a lot of the small-scale communities, when they've been told that insurance exists, and then it with, you know, like how do you manage the retreat, so to speak, right? Or because that is going to be a, a present part of the future, that certain spaces will probably become unlivable or unsustainable. And what is that conversation like within the insurance community, particularly when it comes to very vulnerable uh, stakeholders that they're working with? Thank you. I might turn it to you, Lisa, first on the small scale fishers and first parts, yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's a it's a great question. So I think, well, first I, I would say that healthy healthy fisheries require healthy ecosystems. And so when we're thinking about the unique um, circumstances for insurance um, in the context of small scale fisheries and um, and coastal communities, 
kind of that is is essentially you know the heart of it. We want to make sure that we are are linking insurance and conservation in in this way. Um, and I think that one of the things that I mentioned earlier about you know with the 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 unique factors of small scale fisheries and the the challenges that they face compared to other um, other fishing like larger scale fishing fleets. Those would be some of the um, you know the the unique or different um, elements that that need to be considered for those type of insurance schemes that are um, are not necessarily uh, already part of other um, other parametric insurance or, or other insurance um, approaches. Um, I'm trying to remember the the second part of <laughs> of your question, um, but I I think that let me see here. Yeah, I think that that in terms of of the small scale fisheries, I mean that's the that is the biggest component is is the the scale and the level. Um, and in terms of the the design, maybe I'll I'll turn to some of my. Um, my my experts to either side of me um, to talk more about the the design of the the insurance schemes um, and what goes into that um, in more in more detail. Let me take it for a minute and then I'll hand it back to you. Um, so I'll just reflect on some of the unique challenges we had to figure out or problems we had to solve when we were designing the um, coral reef insurance in in Quintana Roo, and there it was a bunch of problem challenges around sort of governance and legal authority and how that lined up against interest. So in that case, the challenge was the asset being protected and insured was the reef, which is publicly owned. The beneficiaries of that ecosystem service, the protection was the hotel owners. They were the ones who had the cash flow who were willing to pay, but even if they were, they couldn't take out the insurance policy because if they got the payout, they didn't have the authority to authorize the restoration actions on the asset that they cared about. So there were this kind of convoluted governance system that got solved by the hotel owner was agreeing that they were already paying a bed tax and insisted that a portion of the bed tax that they were paying to the government would be dedicated to paying for the insurance premium. And then the government had to agree that in the you know, there had to be a, a place that would receive the money and be able to pay it out, so that because the, the government could then authorize the response actions on the reef and then train these local brigades who then had to have access to the money to go and do it. So you had to work out this whole set of issues trying to align, if you will, the beneficiaries versus who had the authority to to purchase the insurance and then who had the authority to go and authorize the work, which is then different from who actually went and did the work, right? So it was a very, if you will, complex ecosystem of interests and actors that all had to align. It took a long time to figure out, but with a little help from our friends, it got figured out. Maria Jose, I don't know if you wanted to come in on this particular question. Well, I think just building on what Andrew said and, and thinking of how that insurance was expanded to the rest of the Mesoamerican Reef. Um, I think it, the, the process was simplified maybe a bit by having one entity that could purchase the aggregated insurance. But, but as Andrew said, it's still the governance aspect, which is also something I mentioned earlier, is very important, right? Who, who will take the decisions on what areas need to be covered? And how the response will be carried out and who participates in that process. And, and I think it has been uh, figured out in, 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 a, in a very positive way. And it has worked. We, we've had one, one example in, in the region, in, in Belize. But you know the process was carried out through the different elements. And we we're learning a lot from it. But, but the design really involves who First, what what are you protecting, right? In this case, it was the environment. It is the environmental services provided by coral reefs. You want those to be recovered as fast as possible after a hurricane, precisely because so many people depend from the reefs and the services they provide. And after defining that, then who are the different actors that can come in at different points to make sure that that process of restoring those environmental services can be in place. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, maybe just quickly on sort of the latter part of the question. Um, I mean, I indeed, sort of 
insurance markets have hardened a bit generally, right? Um, but I think at least in the context of many of the programs and projects that we've been discussing today, um, WTW as broker has been quite successful in securing very competitive pricing from insurers and, and reinsurers. And you know, one reason for that, at least to date, um, is that for many of these uh, projects and programs, the risk profile sort of associated with them is is a diversifying factor, quite frankly, to some of the rest of their portfolio. Uh, that might change over time, but you know, we have again been quite successful in, in securing uh, good good pricing so far, and hopefully, yeah, that will continue as as we scale. I'm just looking at the clock. I think we might have time for one more question. <laughs> If there is one, there we go. Hi, um, Lara Mars, Unit World Conservation Monitoring Centre. And really building on your comment, which is really very nice, just first of all to say thanks. I've learned such a lot from this. I wanted to ask how sustainable these kinds of approaches are in the face of climate change and you know, the accelerating climate hazards that we're seeing. Have you run the numbers? Do you think this is a, an approach that is going to itself be resilient in the future? Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the question. I mean, I might turn to to my colleagues here who are actually deploying these things, but um, I mean, just to say, I, I hope I hope they will be sustainable. And um, and Marie Jose, I'll let you speak to this a bit more. But uh, you know, for many of these, they're in sort of the pilot or initial phases and have benefited very greatly from donor support or philanthropic resource to sort of pilot them, if you will. Um, but, you know, they have started to, to show their value, and I think the next phase will be sort of building in these, quote, and I hate the term, but sustainable financing, you know, mechanisms to ensure that there are essentially premium finance resources available to, to carry on into the, into the future. But, yeah, I might turn it over to you, Maria Jose, first, just to maybe share a little bit more uh, about your grand vision for the MAR Insurance Program and, it, and its long, longevity, uh, if you could. Yes. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, but first, as you say, you know, purchasing the insurance obviously has a cost. So how do we make that uh, as cost uh, benefit as possible, you know, lower that cost, and how do we make it uh, progress in time? And as, um, as Sarah has mentioned, we have had the benefit of wonderful donors that have helped us pilot the initiative and, and go through go through the trials. Um, I think one, one of the benefits of that is that from the experience uh, of the payout in Belize, we have learned that we can adjust the, uh, the cost uh, given certain variables on the ground, right? So we can say the payout can be limited to the amount of capacity that we actually have on the ground to carry out that emergency response. So if that is lowered a bit, then that has a direct impact on the cost. So we'll, we keep on working on that aspect to fine tune the tool itself and, and its cost. And then for long term, um, again, we governments are very interested in the region. They know the value of having this insurance for coral reefs. They know the value of coral reefs for their countries. Uh, for fisheries, for tourism, for coastal protection, right? The reefs are the first barrier uh, to protect against against hurricanes. So they all know this, and this has been very helpful in trying to move forward a sustainability plan, which would include, for example, an endowment. And we're trying to, uh, we have designed a proposal to try to establish an endowment that can help us, and it's actually a small endowment, that can help us cover the cost from the revenues generated by the endowment, the cost of the annual premium in the region. So this is something that we are uh, working on at this moment, how to make this financially sustainable. Thanks, Maria Jose. I think we've just got about a minute left. So final words from Lisa and Andrew, if you could. Um, well, I guess I'll start since I have the, the microphone. Um, well, thanks again for, for the question and for the final words. I think that um, kind of wrap them both up in uh, in the sustainability uh, question because I think that's um, that's absolutely critical and, and certainly the goal um, of what we're what we're hoping to to achieve here. Um, and I, I think that again the goal is is to have the sustained um, sustained projects. Um, even though we are in the pilot phase, one of the things that is um, is is critical for for the success is the building off of the long-standing relationships that we have with the local communities and building that trust. 
And so really um, kind of reiterating one of the, the um, pieces of advice that I mentioned earlier on the, the um, financial literacy training and building trust, um, I think that really building the capacity and em empowerment within the communities to both protect the, um, the ecosystems for the community health and ecosystem health is really critical and, and um, essential for the sustainability of the project uh, writ large. Thanks, just one final thought. So in, again, going back to the, the case of the work we did in Quintana Row, the coral reef insurance product was really cool and really innovative. But in some ways, the most important innovation was the change in mentality of the hotel owners, the hard-nosed business people, to recognize that nature is infrastructure. The coral reef has the capacity to absorb about 97% of incoming wave energy. It is literally the first line of defense in a storm, protecting a couple billion dollars worth of hotel asset, like real estate assets. And when we walked through the math and walked through the science, there was just like this light bulb that went on for the hotel owners that, oh, the reef is infrastructure. It's protecting my investment, my asset. Of course I'm going to invest in its health and protection. It was that shift in mentality that was so critical to make the whole thing work. And now that that's kind of cemented, that's not the right word, but um, now that that's that shift in mentality, like the hotel owners understand they have a financial interest in protecting the reef and therefore a financial interest to make sure that the insurance product keeps happening year after year to protect their hotels. No, that's, that's a great point. And I think we'll leave it there. But really, thank you so much for joining us in person and online. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you to the panelists. And yeah, have a great rest of COP. <laughs>